Thank you, Tasha. Cool. OK, thanks everyone for joining. Hope you've had a, a sort of interesting and uh, uh, what learn learnful morning. <laughs> you've learned a lot for uh, everything so far this morning. So thank you for joining me uh, on this breakout session for user experience. Um, I am going to run a, a Slido poll um, throughout the session just to try and make it a little bit more engaging. Um, we do have the difficult lunchtime slot, so very much aware of that. Um, OK, housekeeping over. Um, I'm Matt Hodgkinson. Um, I like to create real connections with people. So rather than just giving you a headshot, uh, I've gone with a picture of me and my daughter so you can kind of get a bit of a feel of, of who I am and what I spend most of my time doing outside of work. Um, I head up UX at Kaveya um, and we cover um, the broad spectrum of UX, UX research, design and content as well on top of that. And today we're going to look at who the team are in a bit more detail, the journey that we've been on so far and how we're setting up for success, how we're using research to understand our customer needs better, how we go on to deliver at pace using atomic design principles as well as the Kaveya digital design system. And then we're going to conclude at the end to see how we kind of take all of those elements together and then deliver out quality, accessible digital products across multiple verticals at Kaveya. So, as I mentioned, a lot of the talk today is about understanding your customer. Uh, so I'd just like to run the first quick poll uh, over on to understand what our current uh, sort of uh, role demographic is for the people that are on the call. So if you just want to head over to Slido and I can open up the results. Just give it a couple of minutes. <laughs> it looks like I have someone that's uh, not in any of those digital roles. So apologies if I have missed off an obvious role there. Um, tried, tried my best to scrape it together. Okay. Doesn't look like we have a huge amount of people on the call, so I'm not going to let this last, <laughs> last for too long. Uh, so I'm going to move over now. Um, OK, I mean, the, the, the purpose of, of understanding the demographic of the call better is really just to kind of understand, you know, the, the journeys that, that everybody's on in their own organisations. And, you know, kind of no matter where you are, I, I hope there's some content today that's going to, you know, give you a, a, a something to either take back or think differently about. So what does UX look like at Kaveya? So including myself, we're a team of 12. And as I mentioned, we're split across UX, research, design and content. I've been at the organisation now for around six months. Um, and when I started, we were a team of four. Um, since then, we've set off, set off on a journey um, to kind of find what success looks like in digital. Um, and then contribute to delivering out the organisational North Star of becoming a truly customer centric organisation. So how do we ensure that success for Kaveo? Well, we've increased capacity and capability of the team. We have created research as a function and ensured that we are driven by research and insight as well as data. We evangelise the user at every opportunity. We're driven by innovation as a team and make sure that we're pushing that through, whether it's to product owners, stakeholders, um, and obviously the end goal of delivering out those innovative solutions to customers. We also try to redefine what minimum viable product means. And you know what that means is, is whilst we understand that we need to be able to deliver value at pace, we always try and ensure that we're delivering a delightful experience to customers, regardless of you know whether we're doing something as a quick turnaround or we're invested on a much longer initiative. Um, and also, you know, one of the most important parts of in, uh, in ensuring success is doing so in a collaborative uh, environment. So we work hard to build relationships. The role that I play in the team uh, is to remove what we kind of define as pseudo barriers. So you know, I'm sure people have heard things of. We've always done things this way. Our legacy systems won't allow us to do this or compliance tell us that we need to do that. And these are all important things, right? And they do have an impact on our day to day. 
but we have to be confident to challenge those as a team and i feel that i empower my team to do this by allowing them to self-orientate on projects and tackle things in a culture where you know we celebrate failure as an opportunity to learn and not be afraid of it and to take those challenges forward to the wider business and ask why we don't do things differently and, and why we're being held back by barriers that shouldn't really exist um so um, hopefully that allows the team to do you know what they're here to do uh, rather than kind of focusing in on, on politics and having more difficult conversations. In terms of the journey, um, I've pulled a little bit of a graphic together here to help uh, visualise some of the key points we've been on over perhaps the past 12 months. So the first step in this journey and something that we're going to talk about uh, next is establishing uh, re user research as a function really. Um, so in September of last year, we brought in our first full-time researcher. We then set off on a journey of building our own in-house lab, which you know, kind of meant renovating a, 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 a meeting room, um, you know, well, two meeting rooms, um, bringing in, you know, all the equipment that allows us to kind of monitor real interactions in, a, in an environment where, you know, we don't introduce bias and it can be nice and relaxed to understand customers better. We will talk more about the lab later, so I won't go into too much detail. Um, we spent a lot of time working on ways of working. Um, you know, digital as a function is is still, you know, relatively immature at the moment. We're going through lots of self-discovery, we're reorientating, we're we're looking at those ways of working. So, you know, UX is is a big part of that, and we have to understand where we fit in on that journey. Um, We've established UI as a role, moving away from full stack UX developer, UX uh, designers that did a bit of everything and bringing in more specialist roles. So we remove those bottlenecks when, you know, if we just need UI assets, but we have our, uh, our, U, our UX designers working more on architecture, we, we can cause real kind of slowdown there. So we kind of diversified roles more and brought more, more talent into the team. Uh, we also uh, then spun up our uh, design system in its first iteration. Uh, by nature, a design system is a living, breathing thing, so it, it's never truly finished. Um, but we got our kind of first pass out the door in February of this year. Again, more on that later. Um, as we enter March, um, it's no surprise that we were impacted by COVID. Uh, however, you know, the nature of the team is that we're not phased by change. So having gone, you know, with pretty much two days notice into, into full lockdown, uh, we didn't lose any capability. Um, and what we did sort of have concern about was losing access to the UX lab and therefore a view of customers. We really quickly looked at partnering with a um, third party to deliver us remote user testing capability as well. So that, you know, whilst we're not able to use the lab and invite people into the office, we still have that window into how people currently use, um, you know, uh, our, our products. So moving on into um, sort of July of this year, uh, we again not being phased by COVID, we've brought in more hires. Uh, we've onboarded three people during um, COVID while we've been remotely working. Um, so again, great to have more people on board in the team. It allows us to work quicker and more collaboratively with the wider business. Uh, we've worked on some internal tools there, so you can see Agent UI, that's a, a system that's allowing our colleagues in the contact centre to be more efficient in their day to days. Um, moving into August, we've, we've onboarded a content strategist, so again, whilst we are a team of UX professionals and we have an idea of the right kind of language and terminology to use, there is a lot of language that can cause confusion in insurance and we felt that you know we'd really benefit from having a content strategist join us and that kind of brings us up to date so as of September we've been focusing more now on what the future looks like um, all of the things that we have been working on over the past year is around giving us that permission to play really and rather than just being reactive to delivering assets and journeys that we think as an organization we need we're focusing on a team now of what the art of possible really is um, and really starting to challenge back now with you know what we should be doing to set us up for the future in the digital space um, so i'm re you know, really proud of the team for being able to get us to that place um, 
So I guess the bits you don't see on a timeline like this are all the long hours of trying things and failing and then trying again. Um, it's the building of the strong, uh, trusting relationships with partners in the business outside of digital as well as within. And, you know, without kind of doing that foundational work, none of this really would have been possible. So, you know, it's not an easy journey, I guess, is the key message here. But it's about identifying the needs in your own organisations and then just chipping away at them and, and, you know, celebrating each bit of success that you have in those areas. OK, so. Um, I did have another Slido here, but I'm going to kind of skip through it with um, with that and just kind of talk through where we are. So what I'm doing now is moving into understanding customer needs more. Um, there's a little quote that we kind of use here in the design space, which is people ignore design that ignores people. And, you know, the biggest way of measuring success people use your services. Um, and, you know, what we've seen through years of experience in, in our own journeys as a team is you know if you don't have the right um you know customer centric approach your your product will not be as successful as it can be so how do we go about ensuring that we do understand our customer needs so we all can be affected by unconscious bias and this is something that exists outside of the design space as well as within it um and it kind of happens when we try to solve problems using our own experience or knowledge and we look at products in how we as designers want to use them, perhaps without you know, considering what our actual end user is and what their needs are. So, you know, maybe you've heard these kind of conversations before in your own roles. Um, we don't design for older people. They're not our target audience. Uh, we only have a small percentage of customers with disabilities or accessibility needs. Therefore, we don't need to focus so much time and effort on that, uh, on that functionality. Um, maybe there's only a small percentage of people using mobile devices or tablets at the moment. So we don't need to build our products that uh, that can scale to those devices. And a lot of that is built around assumptions and misconceptions. OK, so, you know, we are all different. I know that's a bit of a cliche, but we are all different and we need to make sure that the products that we produce and the, the design solutions that we provide aren't just trying to fix a problem for one person. They're trying to fix a problem for as large an audience as possible. And that prevents us from delivering a product for a very small subset of customers like we see here. So if we start to remove that wider audience by delivering products that are only based on our own assumptions, then who's actually going to buy it? Who's left? Why is that important? Well, it's important because we need to make sure that all of our products, whether that's internal for our call centre colleagues or external, uh, that they're fully accessible and fully inclusive so that we have that wider net of customers to support. So, Another way to kind of maybe switch that back to stakeholders is, you know, we're, we're all going to become older, you know, and let's be selfish. Let's design for our future self. You know, maybe that isn't our demographic right now, but, you know, we, we will become that demographic in the future. Maybe we're going to have different products that we want to target to different people. So let's not build in, you know, technical debt now by excluding uh, portions of our demographic. Um, we're also going through a lot of changes as individuals, right? Um, what happens if tomorrow you stepped out and you broke your arm? You know, you're going to be impacted on how you can use devices and use technology. So, you know, if we build from the onset to have our produ uh, products, you know, um, work with, you know, uh, screen readers, uh, dictation, voice recognition, then, you know, we, we make it easier for people that don't have an immediate need, but, but might do in the future. Um, even down to simple things around, you know, having children, you know, uh, having children run around a home, um, it, it can cause a lot of, of stress and overhead onto parents um, and carers that, you know, uh, translates to needing to deliver a digital product that's easy to use. You know, we, we're, we're going to be distracted. We can't give it 100 percent, but we still need to be sure, certain that customers understand what they're doing, especially on insurance products where, you know, we, we have a duty of care to make sure that customers understand, you know, the level of covers that they're purchasing. So 
you know what we do is is ensure that um, you know things like accessibility features are built into all of our designs. We partner with our engineer colleagues to make sure that you know the semantic markup and all the things under the hood that ensure accessibility are also there as well. Um, and we can just make sure that you know our products are future ready. What in one instance, we're, we're talking about, you know, using voice over for low vision users or people with a temporary accessibility need really easily translates to the future of smart speakers and using voice to interact with technology in a whole different landscape. OK, so how do we actually ensure then that we are um, taking all these needs into account when we build products well this is where the re ux research function comes into play and they really help us uh, make sure that we are building products for real genuine user needs so during a, a discovery process for example we can identify who our likely users are and what they're actually trying to achieve how they currently um, fulfill that, that desire. So it could be on our own products, it could be with competitor products, or maybe things that aren't even in the insurance landscape, but we can kind of see how people are used to interacting with products. We can then see what kind of pain points, what problems and frustrations they have in those journeys. Um, and then we can build out from that and see, you know, what users actually need from a new service or product to achieve the goals that they're currently struggling to do. Um, there's loads of methods that we can use in that space to, to help us during discovery. It could be user interviews, it could be competitor research, it could be usability testing, which is what we can kind of see on the screen now. Um, it could be longer term things like a diary study where we, you know, spend a month or two really understanding what customer needs are with a given product. So to help kind of visualize that, um, I've pulled together another bit of a map here. So what we can do is, is see what some of our methodologies are and where we use them. So this is our typical UX design process. And as you can see, right at the start, we're involving customers at the very beginning. Um, you know, whether that's a survey, a user interview, a card sort, we can chop and change. Um, but the core part is whenever we set off designing a new digital product, we involve our customers right at the start. Once we're in that initial deep dive and we've gathered the, gathered the, the needs uh, that users have, we take all that data and we feed that into our design team and then we create a first pass of a concept. Um, it might be a prototype, it might just be a wireframe, it could be a high fidelity design, but either way, it's just a proof of concept which we can then take and then put back in front of users again. We can validate that we've understood the problem. We can validate that we're on the right path to start alleviating that problem. Um, and then, you know, we can we can kind of get that constant feedback to help iterate and move forward. As we then move forward uh, and develop that concept, we further refine it. We can use uh, methods such as guerrilla testing. Uh, we're really fortunate in our Halifax location that we've got some great coffee shops and bars and restaurants nearby. So we can dip in and out and just grab real, real customers, potential customers um, and get their feedback. We can also make use of the lab or our remote user testing capability as well to maybe test with a wider demographic. Um, and then once we've kind of gone through that refining phase um, as a final piece, we take our end refined concept and revalidate that with users and kind of make sure that, you know, during that time frame, we've not gone wide, we've not got focused in on a particular area and we've kind of missed that overall customer need. Um, the beauty of this model is that we can flex this as we need to as well. So, you know, we can apply this to um, a feature which might be six months in development, or we can pull that right back and we can apply it to more of a, a maybe a multivariate test where we just take a specific part of a customer journey and iterate through some designs there. So what does this look like in practice? Um, it takes many forms. What we can see here is a discovery workshop that we ran uh, with some internal colleagues for um, uh, an internal um, call center solution. We try to understand who the users are, what they're trying to do. 
we look at how they do it currently so we might run ethnographic research where we go and sit with some of our colleagues in the call center see how they handle calls see the problems that they have maybe using multiple systems at once um, we understand their frustrations and then we kind of understand what are they actually trying to do because sometimes a business assumption around a problem might not quite be aligned with what the user problem is so we try and keep that truth around what is the customer trying to do what is the user trying to do and then play that back to the business so what we can see is um, a workshop happening here we have various colleagues from across the business uh, we have end users from the contact center we have team leaders we have members of our claims transformation team as well as some senior stakeholders and the idea is is that we come out of that session with real pain points a real understanding and not just us as a research team but also the wider business can really start to understand uh, what those pain points are better um, now again this is for an internal project when we run this for external facing you know we'll bring real uh, customers or potential customers into the mix uh, and really start to understand their needs as well it doesn't just have to be limited to within the business uh, so quickly touching up uh, the lab here, uh, so this is a facility we've got in our Halifax location. Uh, as you can see, it's a really nice kind of living room set up. Um, we have a TV in there, a sofa, rewinding back to one of the points that I made, you know, if you are a parent and you've got young children at home, if we want to see how a customer goes through an online quote and buy journey, we can recreate the distractions that you have, you know, bring your children with you, we can put the TV on, we can put some cartoons on really loud, we can create that home environment um, and through the hidden cameras, the screen casting, the microphones we've got in the room, we can really get an insight into what, you know, a real life experience would would be and that's great insight not only for us as a team but we can bring in stakeholders um, and we can really kind of see you know uh, sorry allow them to see you know the the, the difficulties that customers have uh, again we do have a remote research capability as well so whilst we're not using the the internal lab at the moment we can still get that window by you know inviting participants to use their mobile phone to for example show us damage on their car uh, so that we can see how they maybe interpret that on an online journey to, to let us know you know what what level of severity damage they they consider it to be okay uh so that's research uh very briefly um i'm moving now into how we deliver at pace so we use atomic design principles um which can be quite a scary thing um again apologies if you're more than aware <laughs> of what atomic design is but at a very top level, um, we break down everything that we have in a digital journey into atoms, molecules and organisms. And I've got some examples on the screen over here now. So when we talk about atoms, these are very small granular components. It could be a label, it could be a button, it could be an icon. And they all exist in their own right, but they're pretty useless on their own so what we do is we can then combine those into molecules and we can see here where a label and a button comes together to become a, a component an icon a label and some text might also then become a separate component uh, under the under the molecule uh, sort of name and then finally we have organisms which is then pulling all those molecules together into then something which is a usable deployable component so we can see here how the organism is a card and within that card we have an icon a title some copy a label and then a call to action which is then a usable component that can get built, themed and then given a purpose in the real world. Um, so that, that's great because it gives us consistency and it gives us a way that we can communicate with engineers to build real life components. But it needs to be more than just a collection of things. We need to be able to articulate the need and the purpose and have a way of, of, of kind of really understanding that. So. That's where we've built out the Kaveya digital design system. So our design system is a group of those elements like what we've just seen, but importantly, it's the guidelines that help both designers and engineers take those elements and turn them into real uh, customer journeys. 
it enables us to really quickly deliver specific user journeys using reusable design components, which, as we've mentioned, are inherently accessible. And it facilitates communication between teams that allow us to establish our own design patterns. It also ensures consistency throughout these designs because everybody is referring to the same guidelines and principles and talking a common language. So, you know, if, a, if an engineer has a challenge over a particular component, we completely understand what was being referred to. We can identify it in the library and we can have a really helpful conversation around that. The way that we evolve the design system out is essentially through collaboration. So because we're building out a library of reusable components, we try and reuse them wherever possible. But there's always time where, you know, we're trying to deploy a new feature, which perhaps the existing components we have don't quite work. So. Phase one is identifying, you know, when do we need to use new components? And what we do is, is use something called the role, uh, the rule of three. And what we do is, is when we feel in the design space, we need a new component. We present as a UX team, we present three valid cases for why it needs to be a new component. And then take that through to, to phase two, which is a team discussion where, you know, we review that as not only a UX team, but also an engineering team to really understand, you know, are there better things we can do rather than creating a new component? Can we just uh, deliver new uh, guidelines, new use cases, new functionality to an existing component rather than build out a new one from scratch? Um, we have really healthy debate and conversation around that, and then we'll land upon an agreement that perhaps in this case, a new component does need to be created, at which point when it's been reviewed and agreed, that component will then get you know built up and added into the design system and then ultimately into engineering where it's built as an actual functioning piece of um, written component. So. What does the design system look like? Well, here's a little snapshot of, of that. Um, as we mentioned, it's a centralized library of reusable components. We can see some of those on the screen now. Um, but rather than just being page and page and page of just assets, it's an evolving ecosystem that constantly changes. But the guidelines, the documentation, the design patterns and reasoning all coexist. So rather than just handing something over to an engineering team and say, this is what it needs to look like, go and build it. All of the reasoning and explanation sits there alongside it so that the engineering teams can really understand the reasons why we're doing this and any sort of accessibility requirements as well that need to perhaps go alongside that. Importantly, it doesn't compromise on freedom either. So although we're setting really strong guidelines and we're using components where we can, we're reusing them, it doesn't hinder um, that freedom of expression. You know, we can really still be creative and create new components, but we ensure that we have a robust way of adding them back into the design system. Um, what we do with the design system is build an in-house brand. So we have an in-house brand called GoShore. And kind of going back to that timeline, this is this is what we're using to set our vision. Um, we have our own in-house brand because it stops internal stakeholders getting caught up with uh, our sort of customer facing brands. We're not thinking around, well, that doesn't work for our customer set of the of, of today. Um, that isn't aligned with the brand values. It just allows us to have a, a level of abstraction where we can explore really innovative features and put it in front of stakeholders and really take them on a journey of, you know, what what is possible? Uh, let's not be limited by technical constraints or um, existing ways of working. Let's just look at what the future could be in the design space and then work with the business to refine that down into deliverables. And just to kind of end up, um, that's kind of what we're looking at now. So what we have on the screen now are three separate products. One is a Provident Motor um, quote and buy journey. In the middle, we have a concept uh, on GoShore, which is uh, you know looking at 
a broad range of products and how we can present them to customers in one go. And then uh, finally, on the right hand side, we have our internal uh, call center tool, which is branded again as GoShore. Uh, but this is a tool that's used in the call center uh, to help, um, you know, rapidly, uh, rapidly resolve customer inquiries. Um, and all of these three things are built using the same reusable components. Um, you know, it's all validated, it's all accessible, and we can deploy it really quickly, even though it's three entirely different products with very different customers uh, and needs. So that is us bang on time. Um, it was a very quick walkthrough. Uh, I have put off a lot of content. Um, you know, I'd be happy to uh, for you to reach out to me and, and go through any of this in in more sort of detail but i hope you found it interesting i hope you've got a snapshot of what we're trying to achieve at Kavea. and again any questions uh, i'm sure we have a way of uh, filtering those through to me at a later date thank you very much for your time <laughs>